Hi, and welcome to Factaganda 2, the evolution of Jello. Uh, okay, so actually this is um, our first episode uh, involving the extraneous sciences of evolution. And um, I, I just want to start out by saying that uh, I have my prop here, which is a Jello mold. It is a very complex thing to build for somebody who hasn't touched Jello in 30 years. And I have to say that in all respects, I have done possibly everything wrong I could do in the, process, in the, in the steps of making this jello. Um, beginning with the container, which, um, uh, well, it, first of all, it wasn't clear enough uh, for my tastes. And um, second, it, uh, it has a unusual lid system that uh, should you be carrying it uh, by the sides the lid is actually fairly likely to pop open and slide completely off leaving the bottom part to splash jello all over your walls um, but <clears throat> instead of trying to go through the expense and stress of making another one and buying a clear glass pirate's dish or something like that. We're going to shoot with this. It's got a certain wabi-sabi, and I think I've come to love it. And I don't love Jell-O that much to make a whole new one. So, okay, what does Jell-O have to do with evolution? Well, uh, first thing, uh, nothing directly, um, as far as I know. Indirectly, we can use this to uh, look over some of the basic concepts of geology um, and how uh, how certain features of the planet occur and what they mean and, and that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> let's go over the jello first. And um, I want to say that uh, if this had come out really clear, you would see four distinct layers, and I've tried to, to pull out a slice here, and we have a green layer, a yellow layer that has blueberries in it, an orange layer, and a red layer that has cherries in it. And, give me a second. I'm thinking that this will illuminate a lot more. Ooh, isn't that nice? Alright, so, you can see that we have this layer of blueberries down here. Um, we have a lot of air, and that's from the uh, minor explosion that occurred, and we have cherries up on this top layer, and we have a big chunk missing out of here, and that's where this thing came from. Um, <clears throat> so, you'll notice that these berries were sitting there. They weren't injected into the, into the piece, and, uh, you know, i got to say, based on the condition of it, you wouldn't be able to tell if I had injected them or not. But I can assure you they were not. Um, if for, for no other reason you would start seeing these air pockets very deep at each point of the berries. And you can see we have a cluster of berries here with no air pockets around them at all. Um, the way Jello is made, if you, if you listen to the packets, uh, which I did. It's uh, it's actually a fairly simple process. Uh, you mix it with hot water, you mix it with cold water, and then you put it in the fridge for four hours. Now there's a cheater way, if you continue to read, where you can slide that four hours down to a half hour, 45 minutes. And the way to do that is by putting ice in there uh, for a little while, pulling the ice out, then refrigerating it. I can tell you I did not do that. However, for the purposes of science, we can say conclusively that in order to get a layer to gel, it must be in the refrigerator for at least a half an hour. Okay? Um, and the way to build a layered jello with, you know, a green layer, a yellow layer, an orange and whatnot, um, is to completely gel each layer before starting on the next one. Okay? 
So this yellow layer with blueberries uh, had to be uh, put in only after the green layer had completely gelled, or a dead minimum of 30 minutes. Uh, if you go by the book, four hours. And the same thing for the orange layer on top of the yellow layer, and the same thing for the red layer on top of the, um, uh, of the whole thing. So, <clears throat> what does this mean? This means that the cherries in this jello have been in the jello mold uh, the least amount of time, and that these blueberries here in the, in the yellow section have been in the mold for at least an hour longer than the cherries. Um, going by the book, that would be four hours each, and uh, once you set the package aside and you do a little search online, you come up with some interesting things. Like, for example, while blueberries are really cool, my original thought was to put a yellow fruit in the yellow layer like pineapple. And hopefully there's a grandmother snickering at me out there, because pineapple is one of the fruits, like kiwi and whatnot, that have a pectin which prevent jello from gelling completely. And the more you uh, work with it, the less your chances of gelling. And in fact, the green layer got eroded slightly by uh, my attempts to get that yellow layer in there. Uh, I eventually had to toss the whole thing and start all over again uh, with a new yellow layer and, uh, and a different fruit. <clears throat> but that's a different story. <laughs> so, um, so now these things are, are pretty clear, and you can I feel free to ask mom, grandma, grandpa, crazy uncle, whoever who has worked with Jello if if this is true. Um, we would know by the disruption of the smooth surface of the jello that something had been implanted. So these blueberries here in the yellow layer had to be in the yellow layer when it was made. And there's basically three, three ways that they could have arrived there. They were either there before the yellow layer was poured, they were poured in with the yellow layer, or they were inserted into the yellow layer before it gelled, because there are no air pockets anywhere around. And those air pockets will form any time you pierce the jello. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, we have this cluster of, of blueberries over here that have no air pockets around them at all. Like this one does, this one right up front here, because it was near a corner and, and that's, well, that's where we got the damage from it being uh, splashed. Um, but back in here, let me see if I can rotate this without causing any more damage. You can see we have a number of berries that, uh, did not get in the air pockets. So they were clearly in that jello before the yellow layer, uh, gelled. So, now another thing that I was thinking about doing was changing up the layers. If I was going to redo this, I'd get a glass container and I'd go with, you know, start with orange and then go with green and then red and then yellow or something like that. Just so that you could really get a distinct feel for the layers. But, let me hide this for a second. What I discovered is that in its current condition, it, it bears a striking resemblance to the Grand Canyon. And ultimately, this is where we're going to be going with this. So... Like I said, it's got a certain wabi-sabi, and I like it. So we're going to stick with this. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, these basic facts tell us a lot of things. I mean, a whole lot of things about layers. Um, like I said, we know for sure that these blueberries had to be, one, in the yellow layer as it was gelling. Um... And if we had a clear picture of it, some of them were floating, some of them were at the bottom, which tells us that there's variances in buoyancy, but most likely these things were in there as the thing was being poured. So they were in there slightly before the yellow layer was poured, which is why they're in there and distinctly separated from the green layer, which 
unfortunately we can't see, and that is part of the limitations of the plastic and uh, the damage. So, um, but uh, the, the blueberries are also distinct from the orange layer. They're distinct from the green layer, which means they existed either just before, during, or immediately after the yellow layer was poured, before it had a chance to gel. And they have been in there at least a half an hour longer than the orange jello. At least. Now remember, um, went to that website to find out about pineapple. Uh, I discovered other things that uh, fruit layers in general have to be gelled longer. And the reality of this particular jello is that, yes, the green layer sat for about four hours before I started dinking around with the yellow layer. And if we ignore the whole first yellow layer and we just go straight to the blueberry and, and yellow layer, um, that yellow layer sat in the fridge overnight because I wanted to make sure that, that it had completely gelled. Something about fruit holding heat or something like that. They've got to, they've got to migrate the, the thermal constant better or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, yeah, there's a chemist out there who actually talks jello. Weird. Anyway, um, but here's the thing. So we, we, have, uh, we have our cross-section of jello here. We notice that there are no cherries anywhere but the top layer. And here I will pull out a cherry for you. Um, hopefully you can see this. I will pull this up for you. Um, so we have a, a cherry from the top layer. We have a blueberry that was in the yellow layer, and we have our green layer below, and, and an orange layer that's really hard to, to see. It's sort of at the top of this, and hmm, kind of a mess. But here's my point. If I were to pull out another slice of this jello for you, here you go, um, and you were to, like, put on a blindfold, stick your fork in, and come up with, ta-da, a blueberry. There are some distinct things about that blueberry that you could say. You could say that blueberry came from the yellow layer. You could say that it had been in this mold for no less than an hour longer than anything on top, like the, the red layer in cherries. Um, you could say that it did not come from a green or an orange layer, or a red layer for that matter. Um, these are all things that you can know conclusively because of the nature of the layer strata here. Um, so what does this have to do with evolution? Glad you asked. So, um, we're going to remove our failure of jello and take a look at a couple of things that have layers, like the Grand Canyon. Um, I will... Uh, put up a picture here so that uh, so that you can see it clearly but uh, we have uh, strata and layers and layers and layers all the way through this thing and different colors and whatnot each of the different colors is a different set of chemicals that are involved with the dirt. So the, this red layer has probably got, I don't know, copper or iron or something like that. Iron, yes. Green is copper. Um, the yellow is just, you know, sand. Um, and you can clearly see strata in the Grand Canyon that runs all the way through. And this is by some process geologically speaking, of layering being put down exactly like the jello. Okay? Um, so, you know, we know something about this layer, this, this white layer right here in the middle of all these reds. We know that white layer had to come down, it, it, you know, it took so long to form, uh, it got compressed. If we look at this white layer here and this white layer here, if we find fossils from here, and we find fossils from here, we know they're in the same layer of strata. 
they are the blueberries in the yellow uh, jello, as it were. Um, and more importantly, we can get certain key elements throughout history the same way. For example, uh, most people probably remember when Mount St. Helens erupted, and the entire American Northwest got covered in ash and soot, probably the whole West, actually, plus parts of Canada and, who knows, maybe China. Um, well, there have been a number of uh, volcanic uh, eruptions uh, that did much the same. Let's say Pompeii. Um, Pompeii, when Mount Vesuvius went up, it blew chunks everywhere. I mean, it was a cataclysm beyond Mount St. Helens. Um, it, it erupted with a, with a pyroplastic cloud. Pyro, pyro, is that the right word? Let's hope so. Uh, that literally killed people at the dinner table. Um, and that was the, the interesting thing about Pompeii is that, you know, we found people in the middle of doing everyday life things. Um, but the cloud and ash and soot from that, one, was very distinct, like this white layer, and it spread over a huge area. The neat thing about that, for geologists and archaeologists, is that when you're digging down through the layer and you find that volcanic soot layer about where you think it should be, you know that this is the date. You know, this is Mount Vesuvius. We know this is, I'm not sure when that happened, 800 B.C., let's just say. Okay? So, 800 B.C. is right here. So anything below this line, like anything below our, our yellow line, happened earlier than that. The, the green jello happened a half an hour earlier than the yellow jello because it had to be in the fridge. In, our, in, in my case, and that's minimum. Okay, uh, with these layering effects, sometimes there's there's uh, you know a layer down and then a, a fallow period and then another layer down and then another fallow period. Sometimes they're constant, sometimes they're they're seasonal, and sometimes they're they're just layers based on cataclysmic events. You know, so Pompeii is one layer, and then like two layers down is a volcano that happened three hundred thousand years ago. Not sure, um, but that's all in the story of the constituents. Now here's the thing. If we find in that Pompeii layer uh, a bug, let's say, we know that that bug existed in exactly that form in uh, that time frame of Pompeii. Um, it's possible that you know that, that ash layer did not completely compress before the bug fell into it, so it was then or after, um, but certainly before the next layer on top compressed it. Okay? So, and this is why everything's always approximate. You know, well, the, the Tyrannosaurs lived approximately 250,000 years, 250 million years ago. Well, that's why it's approximate. Partly because there's a range, you know. Uh, the Tyrannosaurus didn't just like suddenly appear, dance around, munch on things, scare a few people in Jurassic Park, and then die. Okay? They evolved. There was, you know, there's no joke. Once upon a time, there were two tiny men. Now look how many there are. All right. <laughs> and that's really how it happens. You know, there was something that was really close to Tyrannosaur. But then, like, this one had some mutation where it was just like twice as large or something like that. And that was a really great mutation because they could move faster across land and they could they could muscle out the, the competition. You know, they, they, they took on rafters and or whatever. Um, so, you know, so that guy, and this is really how evolution works, that guy got to procreate. So first there's one, and then, you know, we have a nest, and now there's a clutch of six, and now there's six. Well, now there's four, because two of them didn't get the gene. Okay? But these four, they survive, and they have clutches of their own, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then that particular beast just spreads out. Um, so, 
But it takes some time. It takes generations for that to happen. I mean, think about it. You know, you have a, you have a Tyrannosaur. He lives 30 years. Uh, he can breed as soon as he's 10. Okay? That means very minimum <laughs> to get three generations ahead. He's got to have 30 years to get, you know, a million Tyrannosaurs around the Earth. He's got to have 300 years, dead minimum. That's what we're looking at. Um, every animal is like that. There's a range. There's a dead minimum. Next door, I got a, a lady who's a grandmother at 33. Um, yay! <laughs> Uh, she and her daughter hit that childbearing rate uh, range as quickly as possible. On the other hand, uh, I know women who didn't make grandmother until their late 60s. And that's good too. Um, always range. And that's why we say, best case scenario for a million Tyrannosaurs is 300 years if they're able to breed it at 10 years, but that doesn't guarantee that they will breed at 10 years. And, um, and so if they wait generally until they're about 15, about middle age, before they really start thinking about putting together a family, then that 300 years becomes 450 years, okay, to, to push out all the generations. And that's assuming that they have maximum clutch size and they all instantly find a mate and all breed right away, yada, yada, yada. So that's best case scenario to go from, from one to a million is 450 years, but much more rationally, um, they're not going to have maximum clutch size. They're not going to, you know, there's a lot of other instances. There's deaths and cataclysm and disease and all sorts of things. Uh, if you take a look at, at global birth rates, you know, some families produce a lot, some don't. Some people don't ever have kids. Um, and this happens with every creature. Um, you know, you look at wolves, the, the, the concept of the lone wolf, that's, that's the guy who couldn't find somebody to mate. Um, and he's out of the pool. That means that's one character who's producing no children at all. Um, and that slows down the capacity to breed up to the maximum um, level that, that the terrain will provide. So, <clears throat> okay. Well, got into a lot of stuff there. But, uh, where this all started was with range. Like I said, with these things, minimum range is 30 minutes. What the book says, if you do it the right way, not the cheater way, the right way, four hours between. So we know that somewhere between a half hour and four hours, that green was sitting in there gelling before the yellow got on there, okay? Um, and that's what each of these layers mean. Now sometimes we know exactly what, um, what a layer means. This is a cross-section of a tree. Um, we know that there is a light band and a dark band happening every year, okay? And how do we know this? We've cut down hundreds of thousands of trees and they've all said the same story, you know? There's a, there's a pack of lumberjacks and one nerdy little guy going, yep, 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 big fat wide band right there about 17 years ago when we had lots of rain and big fat black man right after it, yep, 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 oh, yep, and there's the drought right there, and oh, that, there was some rain there, and there was some rain there, yeah, that, that's what, uh, five years before the drought, yep, okay, that, that concurs, and this is, uh, this is how we figure certain things out, so we can tell by, uh, tree rings, one, how old the tree is, you just count on the dark lines, and that's, one dark line for every year. Have we met a tree that produces a dark line every, you know, twice a year or every two years? No. Um, how do we know this? We know, well, for example, I planted a tree as a child, a maple tree that grew up with me in the house that I grew up in. Um, 
um, the people who bought my family residence didn't want the tree there. So they asked us to cut it down. And we cut it down. And sure enough, we could see every, you know, a ring for every year that it was there based on my actual reckoning. I was there. And we've had other trees that were planted on certain special occasions, like trees that were planted on the signing of the Declaration of Independence, or uh, trees that were planted uh, for the founding of the state of California, etc., etc., etc. And you don't have to cut the tree in half. You know, you don't have to cut it down to look at these tree rings. They've got special methods now where they just insert a long tube to the center of the tree, and they pull the core out, and then sap and whatnot fills in just a tiny little, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't even have to be this big around. You just insert a tube and you pull out a core, and you can get all of this information without killing the tree. And then, you know, you just empty out the core, and you can take a look at it, and you get all that information, and then tree sap fills in that line, and the tree's healthy, and you can, and you can both keep going. So, um, so what does this tell us? I, I mean, really. Okay. So in, in the case of trees, this is, this is another issue of layering. Uh, when you do have a, a nice, fat, wide line like this, it means uh, good rain and good sun. There was a lot of growth going on. Um, if you have a narrow line, that means not so good rain. Uh, it, it, the tree is pretty much ultimately dependent on water uh, for its growth. Uh, it doesn't matter how much sunlight or carbon dioxide or you know fungal bacterial growth or whatever that it gets. If it don't got rain, it ain't growing. Simple. Um, so, now if we assume that this is the, the bark right down here, we can start counting these black lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, one. And go back by year. So, this year, during the winter, it was a good winter for uh, for water. During the summer, not so much. Uh, but still pretty good. Last year's winter sucked for water. But last year's summer, pretty good. Okay? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, this year, great year for water. These years here, kind of a drought. Um... And on those occasions where, like, a tree was planted for the birth of the country or something like that, there's, uh, you know, 300 rings, or 200 rings here, 250 rings. Um, and you can verify by um, uh, the records that humans kept, uh, you know, farmers and almanacs and whatnot, saying, oh, yeah, it was a good year, got good rain, crops were great. You know, well, count backwards, sure enough, good year, lots of rain, you know, um, and see these sorts of things. Now, there are trees that exist somewhere, I'm not sure where, where they have done that little tube core thing, and they have discovered over 10,000 black lines, dark lines. Um, <clears throat> that means that tree is over 10,000 years old. Now, I understand that um, there are some people who believe the world is only 6,000 years old, and I have, I have trouble reckoning that. Um, because it's not like, you know, I mean... There are people who give flip little answers like, oh, well, you know, tree might have had a couple of extra growth cycles or something like that, or God made it that way. Or whatever, they, they always have some answer. But they never have a satisfactory answer. We have never, ever cut down a tree and found more rings than we expected. Um, 
we have never cut down a tree and found a big fat white line during a drought. Uh, for that matter, uh, we've never cut down a tree and found little bitty skinny lines during heavy rainfall. Um, we have never found a tree with a pattern other than dark line, light line, dark line, light line um, in pairs for every season. Not once. Ever. Why should we think these 10,000 year old trees have anything to say to us but the fact that they are over 10,000 years old. There is no reason at all to think of that. It's hard physical evidence. And furthermore, we can plant the trees of this type. We can take one of their seeds and plant it and grow it. People have. And they've measured it and they've taken very close logs of them because these trees are so old we need to know for sure that they don't do anything funny. And they've cut those trees down and they've looked at the rings and they've compared them up against the, the chronicles and sure enough, they are exactly what we think they should be. They have big fat white lines during good rain and they have little bitty skinny lines during drought. So, this is a fairly concrete piece of evidence that says something about time. Um, furthermore, we can take these lines and can sometimes compare them to these lines. Because if you've got a 10,000 year old tree and you go back a bunch, you know, a couple of thousand lines and you find a big fat line and you go back to where you think about 2,000 years is down here and you find a muddy layer or a layer that used to be mud that's turned into clay, those two can correlate. They can cross-correlate each other. Same thing for um, coral reefs. Now, I'm not sure of the exact uh, growth rate of coral reefs, but coral reefs have been watched by men, by fishermen, uh, pretty much since we started fishing, which was awfully long time ago, 10, 15,000 years. Um, and in some cases, they've been recorded clearly as to what's going on. And these reefs, I'm going to pull a number out of my butt um, and say that these reefs grow one millimeter a year. Okay? I'm not sure, but let's see it is. Um, I do know that it is a constant. And I could look it up but that would mean a really boring segment of the show. So I'm not going to go look it up. I'm going to just talk to you. So, with a coral reef, you get a layer forming, a millimeter layer forming over the last layer, over the last layer, over the last layer, moving forward, inching forward, a millimeter at a time. Now, if you had the unfortunate problem of dying in between those layers, and then the coral reef just sort of built over top of you, then we would have you preserved in a way that, like being caught in a tree, we could tell exactly the moment you died. We could drill through that coral reef. We could find out exactly how deep you were, how many layers had evolved over top of you and say, oh, well, he's a meter in, so he's a, he's a, a thousand years back. He's a thousand years dead. Um, and that that is the nature of layering. Now, uh, do I have a lot of proof of this stuff handy that I can explain to you? No, that's not what Fact Again is about. Um, what I'm telling you is that if your mind is open here, there is evidence out there, and you can study it, and, and the... the the field is called geology. And you can look at this, and you can look at timing. And this is the certain type of timing that we can find out about fossils and things like that. Fossils that end up in the strata, like that, like that poor fish in uh, the coral reef. Fossils get trapped 
in these layers of dirt. And by going down, this is one of the ways that we can date them. We can know for sure that they were no less than, and sometimes no more than, uh, a certain age. Like, take that Pompeii layer. If you find something above the Pompeii layer, you know that it had to hit the ground and die after Pompeii happened, okay? After Vesuvius. So you know how old it could be, but not how young it could be. If you have two layers, you know, let's say Vesuvius went off twice, a hundred years apart, and you find something wedged in between those, then you know how old it could be and how young it could be, okay? There are other things involved with this, like with the coral. Uh, if we find you a meter in, you're a thousand years, not 995, 1,000, because of the regularity of the way the coral grows. Same thing with the tree. If we find a bug wedged in here, we know what year it was in. And depending upon what it's doing and where, we might even be able to tell you what month, okay? So there's a lot to this. And, and Geology is a whole science. I mean, people spend their entire lives studying this and learning about it. Uh, I mean, the shortest geology class you're probably ever going to go through is the stuff that they give to NASA astronauts. And that was a month long. And they, because they needed them to be able to spot, recognize, and, and search for very specific things. It had nothing to do with trees or layers or anything like that. And there's... Geology is a massive field. And to just, oh, well, what about this? Trying to come up with an explanation for something like that is really hard, particularly if you are not an expert in the field. So, uh, if this is something that makes you curious, I, I thoroughly encourage you to look it up on your own, mostly because we don't have the time. Um, I think this podcast has gone on long enough. And I think that uh, when, you, uh, when you think about fossil transitions and aging and things like that, not everything has to involve radiometrics. Sometimes it's involved with layers. And sometimes it's involved with jello. So um, this is Tedward. Uh, thanks again for visiting Factaganda. Uh, hope to have more of them in the future. And... Um, I think that's about it for now. Um, hopefully have some uh, questions and answers for the next session, and uh, we'll see you soon. Alrighty, have a good one.